name is Ken Mayer. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. A little bit about my background. I've been in this industry in some form or another since the very early 80s, which I realize, for many of you, that makes you think, well, he must be old. Okay. Well, in the 80s, things were a lot different than they are today, but uh, over time, I've uh, seen my work going from uh, basically workstations to uh, you know our uh, big database servers that we had back then, going into uh, network operating systems with Novell and then Microsoft, and then eventually moving into the network infrastructure where I do a lot of work uh, either directly for companies like Cisco or Juniper uh, or Palo Alto Networks or uh, IBM or going around the world and doing the same type of work. So I have a lot of experience when it comes to, uh, especially on the focus of security, with the uh, security that I've seen evolve over time with operating systems on working with all of these different vendors with their security products, whether it's their firewalls or understanding how to lock down their routers and switches, to uh, your storage devices with uh, Cisco or with IBM, and again looking at security issues and the deployment options we have. Again, working with service providers all around the world uh, with uh, companies like Cisco and Juniper and some of their, again, even on the Juniper side with their firewall bases, and it goes on and on. So what I'm hoping to say is that I've had the opportunity to see a lot of different types of vendors that are involved in the world of security. I've got to see a variety of different types of deployments and network designs, and I hope that I can take a lot of that experience and help uh, add that into this course that we're going to talk about, which is the CompTIA's Advanced Security Practitioner. Now in this lesson, we're going to take a look at enterprise security architecture. And so what we're going to see is basically uh, looking at it uh, as far as the basics of what we should look at in enterprise security. We're going to take that and put it into an enterprise structure and then also talk about what some of the minimum requirements should be for enterprise security. So in this topic, we're going to take a look at the basics of enterprise security. That means first we'll make sure we understand the nomenclature, the different components, that is the enterprise itself, what we mean by enterprise security, business goals and security, some of the uh, common enterprise security principles. Uh, we'll take a look at the uh, enterprise threat intelligence and then have the discussion about what to protect. And when I have that discussion, it doesn't mean that there are some things we don't care about, but some things are more important. So we're going to put some priorities in uh, what to protect. Uh, we're going to take a look at providing defense in depth. We'll uh, make sure that you understand that it's more than just buying a, a platform like a firewall. There's certainly other things we can do. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the common components of your enterprise security solutions, take a look at it from the administrative side with policies, standards, and procedures, and then talk about some of the enterprise policy types that you should be uh, encouraging those at the top of this uh, organization to uh, be able to uh, set up and have uh, ready to enforce. So when we talk about the enterprise, uh, and of course, for those of you who are Star Trek fans, it's not what it sounds like. That's basically what we call your company. Now, it says right here, very first one, large, complex organization. Well, okay, it could be. Um, I mean, but it can also be a small uh, mom and pop shop that uh, might have some sort of presence on the web that needs security. Uh, but basically, the enterprise is your company, your organization. Now, you know, that just simply means that, uh, in this case, provides services or goods. So it doesn't mean it's all e-commerce out there, like an Amazon.com or something like, uh, large uh, as an organization there. It could simply be that you provide uh, cloud services. So, you know, you're out here in the Internet world, and you've created some virtual machines, and you have customers that are uh, connecting to uh, maybe run different applications that you have available to them. And, you know, you might be doing this out of your garage. All right, well, I hope you aren't. But anyway, uh, you know, so that's kind of what they mean by the enterprise. Uh, it could be uh, a multinational company that we're dealing with. Multinational sim simply means that we have lots of these local area networks. Maybe one of them is headquarters, another local area network over here uh, on, on different continents. And we're going through what I'm going to hope that this little globe is uh, indicating the uh, World Wide Web. And so we have connectivity either going out through this World Wide Web, uh, where, uh, of course, that's also where my hackers live and uh, might be trying to uh, intercept or destroy your traffic or even attack you. You might be using service providers to provide a uh, specific wide area network connection. So those little SPs are service providers, and maybe they're providing your connectivity 
all the way through uh, from uh, one location to the other. It could be a combination of both, where perhaps uh, one of these, instead of uh, designated as the LAN, let's uh, designate it as your web farm. And so, you know, now we're hoping for the customers to come into your web farm to uh, do whatever e-commerce. What I'm hoping to be able to illustrate here with all of the scribbling that I'm giving you is that there are a number of ways that we can try to uh, describe what an enterprise is. But all in all, what I hope I've described is that it is a single company or organization that uh, we are working for that we're trying to secure. And it doesn't have to be that it spans multiple geologic, uh, yeah, geological locations. It doesn't have to mean that. When we say enterprise, like I said, it could be a small company that has uh, just you know, one brick and mortar location and uh, having employees there. It doesn't necessarily have to employ a large number of individuals. So it sounds like I'm speaking in contrary to what uh, you actually see being presented here. And I am in a way. I'm, I'm kind of saying, you know, there are other definitions of the enterprise. But what we're going to take a look at it is as a large organization so that we can uh, get a full um, idea of all of the areas that we need to look for uh, when it comes to security. Now, when we talk about enterprise security, we're going to take a look at it from what a lot of us like to say is the top-down approach. Now, top-down approach simply means that at the very top of this organization, what we may call the C-level uh, people, the CEOs, CIOs, CFOs, C-levels, that they should be concerned in making certain that they have proper implementation of security. But you see, when you look at it from the top up here, you should see all these different facets of security. I mean, for some of us, depending on the uh, types of uh, jobs that uh, we may be working with, we might be sitting over here looking at the uh, PCs, the operating systems, and talking about security from that aspect. When we talk about the security, you know, we're going to probably uh, list things like antivirus software loaded onto each of these machines. We might even talk about host-based intrusion detection systems uh, loaded on these machines. Uh, we may talk about uh, security or securing the uh, web browsing, uh, it, you know, and, and, uh, and that's great, uh, but that's only a piece of the security. And by the way, there's many more things that we can look at. I was actually talking about solutions that we'd have to install uh, as opposed to uh, policies like acceptable use uh, types of policies, but that's uh, something we have a discussion on a little bit uh, afterwards. Now, some of the other things we have to look at is uh, maybe what I'd call document security. Now, you know, document security to me might be, uh, or at least to some of you, you might be thinking of how it's stored or the storage uh, of where it's at. And by the way, I could relate that back to the PCs. Uh, if these uh, computers, or let's say they were laptops, and they have documents that are uh, inside of them that are very important, that's where we start thinking of encryption. By the way, if you can't tell, that was a padlock that I just drew. Uh, other things about um, uh, storage, of course, would be the permissions. You know, who has the rights to view what information? Uh, you know, it, uh, also how we transmit that information, whether we uh, transmit it securely or not. Uh, you know, it just uh, kind of continues to, uh, as I said, give you an idea that um, at the top of this level, at the top of this, we have to uh, look at it as all aspects of security, where some of us might be more focused on certain areas because that's within our job responsibilities. Again, uh, let's talk about access. Uh, access to these documents, whether it's from the inside or the outside. Again, I kind of already made that uh, hint with uh, permissions of who gets to view, who gets to access. Even, you know what, uh, you'd have to ask the question, who's allowed to create different types of content as well? Um, and, and then, of course, from there, we still have to worry about, uh, well, I'm going to assume, just looking at this here, physical, because I, I see a picture of a door. Uh, right, or, or somebody trying to break in and get it access, right? That goes back to the theft of our information. Uh, you know, I always tell somebody that um, if I can get into your server room, I don't care how good your network security is. If I can touch a server, if I can touch a router, if I can touch a firewall, I own it. And if I own it, then uh, I can do anything I want to with your data, with your information. And there's many other areas that I could probably continue to move into when we uh, talk about enterprise security. But we got to, like I said, look at it in this whole picture uh, so that we understand what's, uh, what we really have to uh, 
uh, to talk about with security. You know, and, and like I said, we still can get into the whole uh, transportation. If I were to just call these lines instead of kind of this uh, organizational chart, if I were just to call this your network, you know, your routers and switches that are making them all interconnect, we have to make sure that we are maintaining our security all the way through, even with the communications that uh, are making all of this happen and possible for us. So, uh, oh, and physical, I'm also going to put policies because we're going to talk about policies in a bit as well. So this is um, kind of the, um, a, a great overview of where we need to go in our discussions about enterprise security. All right, so let's take a look at business goals and security. And, and what that means is that, uh, again, if we look at it from the top of our organization going down, and that's how we should enforce all of our security, by the way, is in a top down, if I haven't already said that. That means that we have to have some sort of a strategy, maybe a business strategy that talks about how we're going to secure information. Now, the first thing you have to remember about security, and, and I've got to say this, because the most important thing that we have to do for our enterprise is make sure that our enterprise is profitable. We have to meet the business needs. That means if my company makes widgets and I decide that, you know, I'm going to lock things down so much that I affect the ability for that company to be able to build the widgets, then my company doesn't make money. Doesn't make money, I probably don't have a job anymore. So there's a business strategy that we have to be aware of. Now that business strategy might have some uh, other regulations depending on the country that the uh, business is operating in that it has to fulfill. So there are some requirements that we also have to include in that. The business strategy might have a risk management type of study that's been done to be able to determine what we can do to uh, lower our risks to keep this company making widgets. Now all of that becomes kind of the, um, I guess you could say the objectives. What do we want to see happen after we come up with this strategy for uh, not only keeping the company running but for the security aspects and putting that together as our security solution. Now a lot of these things like the uh, business impact study or the risk uh, assessment that I just talked about uh, can uh, help you in creating those objectives. And those objectives often will become uh, listed as part of our security policy. And it's from that security policy that we use as a blueprint to be able to come up with the security solutions that we need to be able to put it all together. And by the way, it has to work together. One feeds the other, feeds the other. And again, the goal always is to help maintain business needs. Some of the common security principles that we look at, the first one is called the CIA triad. Now, that always sounds cool because think, thinking about spies with the Central Intelligence or, uh, uh, Agency, but that's not what it is. Uh, what we look at is that we have some sort of uh, asset, whether it's data, whatever it is. We have something that's important to us, and we want to protect it. And so the reason they call it a triad, so I drew it as a triangle, is that we look at the C. The C stands for confidentiality, and the confidentiality can uh, be a lot of different things. It could be the encryption of data. It could be the uh, place in which we store the data. It could be the policies or the permissions uh, that we apply to the uh, data or the asset uh, that we're trying to keep uh, safe. And then we have the I, the uh, integrity. Now the integrity means that we want to have some assurances that maybe the uh, data hasn't been maliciously or accidentally changed. Do we have some checks and balances in there? Or if I'm transmitting this information across a network, confidentiality would often mean, as I said, encryption, and then we'd have some sort of a hashing function, uh, which uh, would uh, help us be able to verify that the data wasn't altered in transit. Now, the A part of it, all right, there's going to be some discussion over this. Some of you may uh, say, oh, no, no, Ken, that's not at all what we were told. Uh, all right, so let me give you one of it. One of them is availability. All right. So, it is possible that we could lock with security this information so much that it's not very available. If it's not very available, like I said, that might affect the way in which we do business. Uh, and so we need to think about that. Some people will say that A stands for the authentication. I'll just say the auth because uh, authentication, authorization sometimes goes hand in hand in our discussions. Uh, which is back to the who has access. Well, I am firmly the one that says availability is great. And, and let's put it this way, and, and let me explain. So if I were to say, okay, here's my asset, and uh, I look at the confidentiality. As I move towards more confidentiality, I'm moving away from availability. 
if I move, let's say, towards confidentiality and integrity as my main goal, I'm moving further away from availability. If I move more towards availability, do you get the picture? Then you're moving away from confidentiality and the, um, and the um, integrity part of this. And so there's a balancing act that we have to try to come up with. And it's not the easiest goal sometimes to come up with that idea. But that's why they kind of put it into a triad is so that you can get the picture of what the CIA is, but how when you overdo one area, I know that sounds weird, right? Overdue security. We, we could overdo security. I mean, if you really want something to be secure, you can store it on a hard drive and lock it in a bank vault or, you know, and post guards around it. But, you know, what'd you do? You lost availability at that point. Okay, another principle that we have to look at is least privilege. Least privilege is the idea that we give every user, everybody, including ourselves, only the permissions we need to do our job and no more. So let's uh, take a look at another common triangle. This one's called Active Directory. And uh, in Active Directory, we have these things called organizational units, and they might have some child organizational units. And uh, within those, uh, they have groups of users, and you know, on goes the, uh, the uh, uh, issue. Well, let's say that I have a user, and this user is assigned to an organizational unit that gives them permission to do whatever jobs that they need to do, because we can put security on that level and groups and the rest of it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make this a Windows uh, class, but what would happen if that user says, hey, in order for me to do my job, there's a printer over here that is a part of this organizational unit that I need to use. Well, if we're not careful, we might have uh, an administrator or you know, a power user who says, oh, you know what, uh, I just want to get this done off my plate, get this ticket out of my way, and put them in that organizational unit so that they have access to the printer. Little did they know that they had the ability from there to create a line of credit to, uh, you know, for people to get loans because they didn't look at the documentation or understand why Active Directory was organized or why user groups were organized in a certain way. And so suddenly, we have a user who unknowingly to some administrator, might have more privilege than they're supposed to have. Whether or not they take advantage, whether or not they even know that there was a problem. If it was me, by the way, if, if that was me, I would know because I t typically tend to uh, uh, push the limits to see exactly what I have permission to do. Okay, job rotation. Job rotation is a kind of a different story. Um, and, and it's nothing to do with the, uh, the, the, the actual technical aspects. Um, but let's put it this way. Let's, uh, let's uh, see if I can draw this out. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, my bank building doesn't look uh, more professional. It looks more like a house. I realize that. And I've got a user over here who's uh, the manager of that uh, particular bank branch. And uh, after a while... Um, depending, again, I'm being maybe more pessimistic than I should. But after a while, this user might start to feel as though they are in charge of this uh, branch and start doing some things that might not be quite so legal. So what we would do with job rotation is we say, look, we're not demoting you. In fact, we're not saying we don't trust you. We are creating a policy that mandatorily says this manager, let's call him manager A, is now going to be transferred to this manager or this uh, bank bank branch, that was a tough one to say, and now they're going to run that one and we'll bring this new manager, maybe from another location, to run the branch that they were at before. Again, it's not a demotion, doesn't mean it's a promotion. What it means is that I now have a new set of eyes that can look to see what's happening inside of here and make sure everything was uh, going well, that the uh, maybe no embezzlement or those types of things. A and it also means that this same uh, manager A can do the same thing at this branch that they were just moved to. And so it gives us the ability to kind of put in a safety check that uh, you know, could otherwise occur when somebody uh, might start taking advantage of being in a uh, position of uh, authority for too long. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea. So that was my job rotation. Uh, kind of analogy. Dual control. All right, well, I already made a Star Trek reference, so you know I'm kind of a geek. And uh, another one of these things I'm, I'm uh, kind of a geek about are uh, these uh, uh, high-tech thrillers. And, uh, and uh, you know, so without uh, sounding too offensive, let's uh, see how well I can uh, pretend that I'm drawing a rocket. 
And uh, that rocket can do damage everywhere if we're not careful. And the question then becomes, um, what happens uh, if uh, somebody who's watching this decides to fire this rocket? And so we create a system of dual control that says that this uh, person A can't by themselves launch it. Person B by themselves can't launch it, this rocket. But if they work together, and this is where those movies come in where you normally see like they both have like a key that they have to turn into a little lock and both turn it at the same time so there's an agreement and there might still even be a, a user C uh, over here who uh, has the launch controls or, or the, the codes that has to provide those uh, as well. And, uh, and so that's kind of the idea of dual control. Now you might say, well, you just went off the uh, reservation here, Ken. We're talking about networks. Yes, we are. Dual control and networks can uh, operate the same way. Um, you know, if you're thinking about uh, doing tape uh, backups or any type of backup, tape, storage area, whatever, you might have a user who has permission to back up files. One of the problems is, is that that person may be backing up files that they don't have permission to see. So we would give uh, the job of restore to a different user. And that way, one person couldn't back up the files and then restore them uh, onto a system that they could look at those files. Uh, it could be uh, maybe firewall administration that uh, it takes two people to uh, work, oops, FW, with the firewall uh, to administer it so that we are, uh, again, making sure there's no one person who might uh, accidentally, and remember, not every time I talk about security, I don't want to, you to assume I think that there's always people that are trying to sabotage you and your company. But, uh, but you know, whether they accidentally or purposely uh, allow some traffic in, it, it could be a bad thing for us. Uh, mandatory vacation to me kind of goes back to the idea of job rotation because again if I if I make it mandatory that you take a vacation now that doesn't mean I have to tell you when to take the vacation I just have to say yes you must take a vacation we give you vacation time so I want you to take a solid week off you take the solid week off and that assistant manager person can come in there and take a look at uh, what you're doing uh, as far as uh, you know how you manage the systems, how you know all of those really kind of cool things. Um, and you know, as much as I just talked about dual control, you know, the backup and restore firewall is probably the best example. The uh, rocket ship, I'm going to kind of put that down here. That's kind of that uh, separation of duties again. Uh, they, to me, they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, the uh, idea here is that it takes more than one person to be able to do a certain job. Uh, and, uh, and some of you might say, well, this just sounds so inefficient. If one person could do all that work, why am I having to spend uh, money hiring a second or a third? A and you know what you're doing is you're investing into your security at that point. Now, one of the things we take a look at is uh, what's called threat intelligence. Now, threat intelligence is where we're gathering information about the current concerns in the world of security. Now, we gather this information in a variety of different ways. And when you think of security, and I, and I, I hope that you uh, have heard me say this enough, it's not just technology. Technology is just one piece. We have physical security. We also have the administrative uh, needs for security, whether they're creating just you know, pieces of paper called policies uh, that we use as the blueprint to uh, enact our physical or technical types of, uh, of security, but we need to look at threats from all angles. Uh, as an example, I worked with a company not long ago that does uh, credit card processing. We're actually, they're the ones that run the network, so when you slide your card, they're securing that information. And uh, for me to get into that building, I had to go through, of course, some sort of a background check. Apparently, I made it through because I got in the building. I had to surrender my driver's license. Couldn't get it back until I uh, left the building. And I always had to have an escort with me wherever I was going. Now, this is a regular enterprise company, not a military organization that was dealing with top secret types of, uh, of uh, information. But, you know, this whole process probably came about because part of the management team or maybe uh, part of uh, you know, some other team uh, realized that they have to have a certain level of physical security, knowing what I said before, that if I could touch something, then I can own it. Or whether you're worried about me uh, picking up, you know, let's imagine I'm walking through your office, and I just start picking up notes and memos off of people's tables and stuffing them in my pocket so I can read them later. You know, all of those are, are kinds of the ideas of what we gather as far as the types of threats. Again, we could talk about the newest uh, 
type of uh, vulnerability in an operating system or the newest type of uh, SQL injection. I mean, all of these are posted on a regular basis. So we gather the threat intelligence and we have these different teams, management, development, quality team, we could go on, that are going to analyze and give their evaluations or ratings about uh, what they think is the risk of that threat. Now when I say about the risk of that threat, that really kind of goes into a risk assessment. And we put that information together to be able to develop a security policy. And then from that security policy, as I said, we would then be able to start building a security solution. All right, what are we going to protect? Well, one of the first things is data. And again, everybody starts thinking, hey, I, I like this idea of protecting data. These cylinders, by the way, are a couple of hard drives that we'll say are in a storage area network becoming more and more popular. It's very popular right now. You know, because we might have a virtual host, virtual machine uh, out here acting as a cloud that needs to have uh, connectivity uh, to this. I might have some other type of server farm for the web that's uh, utilizing uh, maybe a, a SQL database server and, uh, and then, you know, all this customer information is all being fed to the storage area network. And so, you know, when we're talking about protecting data, and I hope I've said this already a number of times, we have to figure out a couple of places to, uh, to secure it. First of all, uh, let, let's put the internet over here. So this is the www where the customers come in. So where am I going to protect my data? Well, I'm going to have to worry about protecting my data uh, from users coming in, whether they're maybe trying to break in or be hackers, or if they are legitimate users, we're going to look at some type of encryption. But then internally in my network, how, you know, as it's being transmitted back and forth from, uh, from the cloud or the web or this uh, database or wherever we're sending it from, we should also consider protecting that information because, yes, there could be a user in this network who might be a part of a remote access Trojan or botnet because they may not have understood not to download certain files uh, or bring in certain files. Or this might be that user, what's the new thing that we have to worry about, who's got a tablet and, uh, and they're using their uh, 4G connection but also using the Wi-Fi connection uh, inside your network. And, uh, and so now they're bridging new methods of people coming from the outside into your network without even going through your security. So we got to look at all of these different communication paths and of course even here we have to decide are we going to encrypt uh, the uh, information that is on the uh, hard drives? Are we going to uh, have some sort of uh, uh, integrity solution to uh, make sure that that information doesn't get changed? Um, you know, what kind of application are they using to uh, bring that data in? Is that, you know, like uh, maybe I should better say over here, the application on the web server. Is it set up in a way to uh, make sure that only valid changes can be made to the data or that it collects the right kind of information? Uh, for instance, if it's a form to put in your uh, first name, last name, birth date, and somebody mixes it up and puts a uh, birth date for a first name, I mean, is this application smart enough just to, to uh, check for accidental types of integrity issues? let alone uh, people using it to, uh, to uh, otherwise corrupt your data. Um, you know, and so anyway, all of these uh, are, are things that we have to worry about. And then, of course, like I said, we still have the physical barrier that we have to put in place to keep people from getting into the technology layer and trying to cause us problems. Okay, so what I described are resources. Your storage area network is a great uh, example of a resource. Uh, e even though I was talking about the data that's on the drive, the resource is still the uh, is usually like a storage area so that we have uh, the ability, hopefully, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, physically secure it, like I said before, or uh, make sure that we have the right permissions for uh, access or, you know, to check the integrity, uh, personnel. All right, so uh, I just drew a physical barrier. Let me just finish this physical barrier. And uh, if I could uh, imagine putting some 3D in here, but I won't, I'll just say that here's the door that goes out into your car's parking lot. Right, there you go, your parking lots. Does that look like parking lots? Probably not, pretty crooked. But then I guess you've never seen how I park. Um, so, so those are perfect for me. Um, anyway, going back to um, 
Uh, well, back to that uh, credit card processing company. They're, they're, that's a perfect one. Uh, they've had problems with their personnel leaving to go out into the parking lot. And while out here, being approached and bribed by people that would want to uh, help have them help get them access inside. Uh, that's better than being kidnapped, right, or abducted, but still they have uh, that problem. So we still have to talk about protecting personnel. Uh, by protecting personnel, that's where the, the security comes in. Um, you know, all of these, and I could just continue to go on, that's where you may be putting in guards. Uh, you know, in fact, there's a whole study on security that deals with, believe it or not, this uh, entire feature, like where are the light poles at? Do you have enough light poles so that the whole parking lot is lit up to help uh, make sure the people are safe? Uh, do you have uh, video cameras? There's my tripod for my video camera out there watching. So I can, I could just go on. And all of this, by the way, is protecting these intangibles. Wow, now the intangibles, that's a harder one to deal with. As an example, this last holiday season, there was a report of a large department store chain that uh, they said had lost up to 110 million credit cards of their customers. Here is an intangible. What do you think that did to that company's reputation and uh, what they want to do to uh, make people feel comfortable to come in and shop with them again? That costs them money that is going to be really, that's why it's an intangible, hard to come up with a, you know, what is it really going to cost them? What is the cost for, uh, to, to restore that faith? I mean, are they liable for uh, illegal charges? Are the banks going to come after them? Uh, you know, is this going to uh, reduce business? Right? These are all things that uh, we look at when we're talking about uh, protection. Because believe it or not, if we're doing this stuff up here pretty good, then we're protecting our intangibles. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and that's kind of uh, what we're really, really looking for uh, is, you know, when it comes down to it, we're going to see that we're liable for our uh, customers or internal uh, data. And what if I'm just an employee whose uh, human resource record um, was stolen or I'm a patient at the doctor's office and my medical records were stolen? I mean, right, we're, that's going to cause that doctor's office some uh, problems with reputation, maybe legal issues. So, uh, in a way, they do all go hand in hand when we talk about what to protect. Now, this idea of defense in depth is very important to us because the idea is, you know, we've got a hacker who's going to try a variety of different ways to uh, be able to break into our networks. And we're going to look at it from kind of a simplistic uh, method here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the path. We're going to assume that the attacker is coming from the outside and is going to enter into your network. Now, again, this is from the outside. Um, right now, I'll just tell you, I've heard that approximately 15% of our uh, real dangerous attacks occur from the outside, meaning that the other 85% of our attacks are over here. Well, I'll deal with that in just a second. So, what do we have? First, we have a firewall. Now, a firewall is a device that typically looks at what we call layer 3 and layer 4 information. Those would be your source and destination IP addresses, layer 3, and the protocol, usually TCP, and the port number that it's trying to connect to. Uh, for instance, port 80 as a destination port if it's to a web server. And then the big goal of the firewall is to, to block that 95% of other traffic that's coming through, allowing just a certain amount of traffic to uh, come in. For that reason, I tell people that your firewall is really not very useful in being your only security. And let me put it this way. Let's, let's, let me just uh, kind of diagram outside of this. Imagine that this is your web server. And, uh, and your web server is protected by a firewall. We often see a, a firewall symbol like that, you know, where we're blocking traffic. And, uh, and the attacker is coming from the outside. I'll give them an A for being an attacker. And all they have to do, it, and let me tell you why your firewall is not very effective as your only form of security. It, it's got two weaknesses. The first is that we, as the administrators, might misprogram the uh, actual security logic. And number two, it allows traffic because, let's face it, we want that traffic to go through the firewall to get to our web server so that uh, we can have uh, maybe e-commerce going on. So it allows traffic. And that traffic that's being allowed, even though it's very restrictive, what did I say? 95% of the traffic is blocked. So it's just letting 5% or less of that traffic through. 
but attackers know how to take over your servers based on the traffic you allow. So that attacker uh, comes in, they get through the firewall because they followed your firewall rules. So we add another layer. Whether it's intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems, by the way, I, I prefer those. Uh, if you, uh, if, well, I'll diagram a reason why here in a second. Um, but uh, what it does is it scans through what we call the layer seven. That's your application traffic. Uh, that means it could be looking for malware. It could be looking for command and control types of attacks. It could also look for anomalies coming through, meaning traffic that's not normally seen. And the goal then is that if you know the attacker is uh, sending the traffic into this uh, into the server, and now you put another device intrusion detection in there to scan and see what that traffic is that's going through there, the actual content of the traffic, then you are reducing the likelihood that they are going to send you a known uh, bit of malware, vulnerabilities, or whatever the case may be. And of course, uh, we can also have this system constantly backing itself up. So if it was compromised, at some point we hope that we could uh, do a restore and get our system back together. Some people call it a shadow backup, uh, but that uh, brings us into the real-time backups and then boom, uh, out we go. Now, uh, there are some firewalls out there that can do the intrusion detection and the firewall in the same uh, actual uh, architecture or in the same hardware or appliance that you buy. Uh, I'll let you make all the studies that you want, but you'll see uh, some of the big players, of course, are going to be things like Checkpoint, uh, the ASA by Cisco, the SRX by Juniper, uh, the Palo Alto Networks Firewall, uh, and a bunch of others. For those of you companies who do firewall technology and I left you out, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not reading from a list. I'm just kind of uh, throwing them out there saying that we have some boxes that can do both of these uh, and maybe even more. There's some that can uh, certainly do a lot of other cool stuff. Uh, all added into layers of security. So we uh, are doing good from that aspect, but like I said, we do have to worry about often uh, the traffic on the inside. Now, again, d defense in depth. Well, what about this inside? I, I can't just let that go, I guess. Uh, let's talk about it. Like I said, you could have a person over here who's decided to bring in their, their tablet or their smartphone, and they're making their 4G connection uh, while it's also connected uh, you know, to your system and computer. And so suddenly now the attacker's traffic can come in in a direction that's completely avoiding all of the potential uh, security layers that we have created. So what can we do here? Well, we could still uh, add a couple layers of security here. We can have that host-based uh, antivirus program that's uh, looking for malware. There are host-based intrusion detection systems that we can put on this uh, as well. There are things that can do integrity checks on uh, files and systems to see if they've been corrupted. So that even if we are allowing people in, which we shouldn't be, uh, but uh, we can't control all the users, that we're still adding layers of security. Uh, in fact, there's also host-based firewalls as well that can control the traffic coming in and going out. Um, and, and so we can also add some layers of security, as I said. And in fact, if uh, somewhere in your network you were connected to uh, a server farm, my little tilted server there, you could put another firewall internally, or IDS, or both, to uh, protect inside parts of your network. So when you think of layers of security, it is just what it sounds like. Lots of mechanisms looking for the potentials of malware or other attacks or just you know, uh, making sure you ensure um, uh, that your policies for allowable traffic are enforced. And we can do that not just from the outside, but also while on the inside. Because as I said, you, know, you have to worry about uh, people bringing in their own device. That's kind of what we call that, BYOD, bring your own device. Uh, but we also have to worry about people bringing in their own files from home and installing them on their uh, computers inside the office and not realizing that they've opened up uh, a door. In fact, I'm running out of room to be able to describe this, but a lot of your firewalls and intrusion detection systems, when it comes to the uh, inside traffic going to the outside, generally speaking, most of those firewalls allow 100% of that traffic to go out because we're trusting those people on the inside. And so then they hit some sort of malware server, botnet server, that uh, sends a reply 
And because it allowed the traffic out, it allows the traffic in. So that means that our firewall was fairly ineffective because if that uh, malware server had initiated the traffic, it would have been blocked. But because it was a reply, uh, then it's usually allowed. So we have uh, sometimes the logic of how we create and uh, the rules on these firewalls that can also defeat us and make it easy to see why I uh, said that we uh, sometimes worry about up to 85% of the attacks actually being on the inside of our network. I did say I'd talk one uh, bit more about the IDS and the IPS. So here's kind of the idea. We usually have, let's uh, call this the World Wide Web, and uh, many times we might have a screening router. That uh, screening router can use what they call an access control list to block a lot of traffic. Uh, then we usually would go through a firewall. And uh, from the firewall, at some point, we would have a core switch or a core infrastructure that uh, would uh, begin to let us distribute our traffic. And uh, the difference between IDS is that, uh, and IPS is that IDS sits outside and gets a copy of the traffic that's coming through. And based on that traffic, the IDS, and depending on the vendor, could send a new firewall rule that says block something because it looks bad. But uh, often it's too late because, remember, we got a copy of the traffic, which means that uh, malware has already been sent to the victim. IPS was designed to be inline so that the traffic from the firewall goes to the IPS. The IPS does everything the IDS does and can block it right there before it sends it to the core architecture, providing more protection, but often at the cost of less bandwidth because it takes a lot of processing power to do those types of inspections. So, you know, it's your trade-off. Again, uh, security was that CIA where, you know, we have more security but maybe less availability with IPS. We have a little less security with IDS but more availability. You have to make the call. Now, when we talk about some of the common components of enterprise security, uh, the first thing we look at is uh, what I call the administrative part of this, the paperwork, and that's the policies and procedures. Because let's face it, you know, we could just say, oh, um, I've read in the news we need a firewall, let's just go buy one. All right, so then what, how are you going to program it? What logic? What's allowed? What's the purpose? Uh, you know, and, and so the uh, answer becomes, oh, I don't know. I was just told to buy a firewall and my network would be better. Trust me, I've run into owners of businesses that just say, uh, you know, especially in the days when firewalls were first getting popular, they just say, hey, uh, Ken, I, I hear I need a firewall. Go get me one. And, you know, it's like, okay. Uh, what do you want to block? What do you want, you know, and, uh, but they didn't have any real idea of what their goals were, right? And those are the policies and procedures. That's that blueprint, uh, at least the high-level one is a blueprint that uh, helps us create other procedures, other standards that we have to follow that we can enforce with uh, your particular hardware. And of course, like I said, there's also the software capabilities uh, of our security solutions. The software could be integrity checking, as I said. It could be the encryption, uh, or it could be malware detections, uh, things we call anti-spyware, anti-virus, um, uh, host-based firewalls. So we have a lot of different uh, security components. But again, it's not just a matter of just going out and buying this stuff uh, or just installing it and saying, let's call it good. I, I mean, as an example, you might have been told that buying antivirus software for your computers is a good thing. Now, I'm not saying it isn't, but some of your existing applications might break by your installation of antivirus software, especially if you have a company that makes their own types of applications where it may be doing system calls that your antivirus software thinks is some sort of an attack, and then things just come to a crashing halt. Again, remember, business needs have to be your priority. If you have a server or a system that suddenly doesn't work because you just installed AV, uh, thinking that's what you should do to be you know, more secure, then you have to run the risk of actually losing money, losing service, production, uh, and everything else. So again, I I'm trying to sound like a good politician. There's goods and bads to every solution. You need to have a policy and procedures in place to understand what it is you're trying to protect, why you're trying to protect it, and as well as that, uh, beyond all of that, there has to be a testing phase, a rollout phase, uh, you know, evaluation phase as well. So like I said, your security policy is the, the architecture, the blueprint that begins this. And it's going to lead to uh, a really more specific policies. 
you're going to lead to uh, things that we call the um, standards, procedures, and guidelines. So standards are basically our way of verifying that we have had uh, the security in place the way we want it to. I mean, the standards are going to come from the policy. If the policy says, protect my customer database, and then you've done some more research, business impacts, risk assessments, and you've come up with the standards that say, here it is. And then we're going to have procedures. Uh, procedures might be uh, how we access that uh, customer database. Uh, is there a particular application we must use? Are there particular people, uh, right? Things that we call like acceptable use. Or guidelines about uh, the usage of that information, which could come from regulatory uh, aspects of uh, laws in the country that your uh, business is working in. So all of those are a part of really what's building uh, what we're going to see as a solution with our hardware. Here are some examples of different policies that uh, we'd uh, normally see. And again, remember, this is all around the idea of security. The first one is the acceptable use policy, or the AUP. And, uh, you know, this is a big deal to us. It's uh, really about um, telling employees uh, how to use or what is acceptable um, practice uh, or, you know, employee rules, let's call them that. And, and here's a big uh, idea of uh, what I mean by this is, you know, some things cost us money. I remember many, many years ago as a contractor, I had... Uh, an account with this uh, company, this client, and uh, they had just gotten a new color printer, and I found out that Ken had permission to print. So I did. I then found out they audited the prints and said, hey, you're going to have to pay for the, uh, the, the toner that you used. And it's like, oh, okay, that's fine. But I didn't have an AUP that said I couldn't print. I just said, oh, well, there's a printer. I got something I need to print. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, and I still continue to work with that company. Don't worry, I didn't get in big trouble. But, you know, they had some rules that they wanted to enforce. Uh, they enforced it post my doing it by their audit and uh, had forgotten to tell me that there were rules that I couldn't do certain things. And I actually didn't think it was, you know, so bad to just print 50 pages. But, uh, but it was there. So, um, and it could be worse, right? Uh, you know, a lot of times... Uh, email. Email is a big thing, right? Don't use your company email for personal reasons. Uh, don't be, you know, doing an email tag with somebody you met online. Don't be doing that while you're at work. You know, it's uh, all of those are, are things that we uh, usually have to make sure our uh, employees and, and everybody actually should know. Uh, planning policies. This might be for a backup and restore plan. And that's important to us, right? Because we don't want to lose information. We don't want to be down for a long time. Uh, and also what I call the uh, incident, um, incident response um, uh, type of policy. And, uh, and that's important too. Because uh, and especially this should be uh, uh, a big thing with training of our employees. That if they see some sort of uh, action uh, that could be a security problem, that they ought to have a place or a person or a, a, a process that they can go and uh, actually say, hey, uh, we think something needs to be done here. We're, we might be in trouble. All right, I've already talked about the security policy itself being kind of that blueprint. And, uh, and that's kind of the top level part of that security process that, uh, you know, would uh, hopefully lead to the guidelines and procedures. You know, it's um, uh, things that uh, really, it, it, as a blueprint, it's um, a way of uh, guiding uh, the company to security or to better security. And that's uh, what we're looking for, is uh, a way of having that blueprint to follow. Uh, and, and, you know, when I say guiding to security, remember, I broke it down into things like uh, ad admin stuff, uh, which is the um, things like the acceptable use policy. It could be in the actual uh, technology, uh, you know, even down to the point of telling you how your passwords uh, should look, you know, how long they should be and how complex they are. Uh, not just what firewall to put in and what rules to have. And it should also include physical. And that is, do we have guards, fences, gates, locks, magnetic key cards, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, the next one is a policy on remote access. So remote access is uh, basically uh, the most common one that all of us would see might be something we think of as VPNs. Okay, remote access does cover more than just uh, virtual uh, uh, private networks. Uh, but, uh, you know, the idea was is you could be at home and uh, you're going to work from home and so you're using your internet connection to go through the internet to get to headquarters. 
and uh, and so we have uh, you know some acceptable use policies, uh, or I should say, remote access policies. Sorry, that said, okay, uh, we want you to use a specific uh, laptop that we have uh, uh, put together for that use. We don't want to use your home laptop, and uh, certain uh, types of protocols that we're going to use to create this tunnel to uh, encrypt our traffic, and uh, and so uh, as well as uh, when we when you make the connection, then we're going to figure out what your permissions are because uh, we realize that uh, you might not be as a secure environment at home as you would be if you were in our network. So all of those come up there with us. Wireless security policies as well um, will usually be, again, the uh, device or security uh, requirements uh, or the type of device. Because, again, I don't want you to bring your own uh, type of uh, wireless device. And, and people will do that, by the way. They'll come into your office and hook up the, their uh, wireless router from home so they could have uh, their telephones, smartphones, tablets connected to your network so they didn't have to pay for their, uh, their cellular service or something like that. Um, you know, so, uh, so that, that's again going to be uh, also security requirements. You know, and, uh, and maybe even uh, talk about guest requirements. Uh, I mean, that's a big deal in today's uh, world is that we are uh, uh, allowing guest uh, access uh, you know, somebody coming to visit our company, they can get out to the internet through our company, but uh, can't get uh, internal access. All right, I already said uh, password authentication policies. So, you know, here's where that main security policy might detail some of these other uh, events. In fact, as I said, it's a blueprint to follow. Um, and that's usually, again, the guidelines for strong passwords. When we say a strong password, what are we actually saying? And, and most of you would hopefully say, okay, that's the length of the password. So now that's a good question. Most companies make minimum eight. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that that's not sufficient because of uh, this uh, technique of uh, being able to take those password hashes and uh, take them through these pre-created uh, pre uh, hash tables. Some people call them rainbow tables. And uh, right now, most eight-character passwords probably can be figured out in a few minutes. Uh, you know, so... Uh, I would tell you at a minimum 15, but now I'm uh, lecturing. I guess I'm not supposed to lecture. I'm just telling you uh, some things about security. Uh, complexity is another one. Now, the complexity, again, is that we don't use uh, passwords that are all letters, all numbers, or dates of births, or, you know, things that are easy to guess. Uh, that's where we want uh, uh, what we call the uh, alphanumeric, upper lowercase uh, letters, uh, numbers, special characters as well, um, you know, like uh, the um, uh, at sign or a, um, a exclamation point or something like that, a dollar sign, uh, adding into the complexity. And, uh, and so that's uh, a way, again, that we are trying to increase uh, the security. Uh, because let, let's face it, uh, your password right now is the weakest uh, thing in, when it comes to your, uh, your security uh, because um, of this uh, thing that we call social engineering. Uh, social engineering is almost half of all attacks where I'll just call somebody and pretend to be an important person or ask for your help um, or maybe I'm just watching you type in your passwords or maybe I'm just listening to you speak and, uh, you know, and, and telling somebody else your password. I have so many different stories. I was um, you know, flying at a, into an airport um, in this, well, I don't want to give away which even airline it was. Uh, we'll just say it was in the uh, southeastern part of the United States, and they didn't have my su my suitcase. It was it was lost, and I was at the baggage counter, and uh, the lady back there couldn't log into the computer, uh, so she got on her walkie-talkie. Remind you, walkie-talkie means unencrypted communications, and asked what was the password and the username so that they could log on to check for my suitcase. And uh, over the walkie-talkie, I could hear them say the username and password both were baggage. So not only did we not have a strong password, uh, we had an easy-to-guess password, and the password was the same as the username, which is often called the John Doe password. And, uh, and all of those were, you know, I just thought to myself, wow, post 9-11, and, and uh, I just learned the uh, way to get into the network. Uh, physical security policy. Anyway, that was social engineering, the whole point of that story. Uh, and I didn't have to do anything. I just had to stand there. All right, so physical security, uh, again, is how we control uh, access. So let's talk about that. Let's start from the outside. How about building access? 
Do you have, uh, you know, the uh, need to have a, a key, a magnetic key card? Is there a guard at the front of the desk? Do you have the building surrounded by uh, fences, gates? Uh, did you design uh, the sidewalks to uh, force the flow of foot traffic into a certain door or car traffic? And then once inside the building, uh, let's talk about your server room uh, or whatever you want to call your network operations center or anything else. Uh, how do you get into that uh, location? Uh, again, is it uh, key cards or combinations? So I was uh, doing some other, other work for this company in the south. We'll just say in the south. And, uh, and uh, I was walking down. There. I had a badge to get into a lot of the buildings. But there was a particular room that was actually the only room without a, a label, uh, which some people in security, they say, hey, important rooms, don't put a label on there. And I'm thinking, well, at the same time, if every other door has a label and this one doesn't, then it's probably important. But it had a um, key card need for me to get in. And my key card, so I tried it, by the way. I, w I guess I was bored. But they gave me a key card, so I tried it. And, uh, and my key card didn't work. But the door had a little window so I could look through the window. And then that uh, window, I saw on the inside a biometric fingerprint scanner, right? And uh, I saw a combination lock. So even um, if your fingerprint matched, you still had to know the uh, combo lock. Uh, and by the way, when it comes to authentication, which uh, I guess I didn't mention with the authentication policy, uh, as I've already talked about it, but uh, now that I'm, I'm bringing it up, I'm bringing it up. So you have it. Uh, this is called a multi-factor uh, type of authentication. It's uh, consisting of something you have, a key card, something you are, biometric scan or fingerprint scan, and something you know, which normally would have been like a username and password. Um, and so I looked through there and I realized that even if my key card had worked, the rest of it wouldn't have worked. Now, while I was peering through the window, uh, somebody from the company, uh, well, I think they snuck up behind me. I didn't hear them coming and they asked if I, they could, you know, help me. It scared me a little bit, but I just told them who I was, what I was doing. And, uh, and of course, my badge said visitor. And, uh, and so they let me in. They opened it all up and let me look inside. Ooh, we're back to social engineering, defeating everything. Okay, well, I wasn't there to hack. I was actually there to help. But uh, I hope you're getting the points of these little stories uh, that, I, that I'm telling you. So you kind of get an idea that even the best ideas in security, we still got to think about weaknesses. Uh, network policy. Uh, again, well, all right, so a formalized uh, statement or set of statements that talk about the uh, network function. Uh, okay, again, that might go back to the acceptable use policy uh, when we think about that. Uh, you know, we might say, you know, uh, whether or not you get use instant messaging, uh, maybe how you use the voice over IP phones. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it just kind of goes on and on. Uh, do you get to download illegal files through your own BitTorrents? Well, let's hope not. Uh, right, but uh, so, you know, all of that kind of comes back together uh, in talking about how we do uh, our, uh, you know, work with our networks. Uh, we might uh, also have uh, issues of... Uh, quality of service or talk about uh, backups and restores. Um, an audit policy is also important to us. That's where we're collecting information. Uh, generally, we might uh, talk about things like a syslog server uh, and that uh, syslog server or SIM uh, collecting information from a, a bunch of uh, different security devices to help us analyze what's happening. Um, or, you know, on Windows machines, uh, might be an event log that we're analyzing for security or uh, even, uh, remember, not just security, but it could be system events like uh, certain software pieces uh, beginning to fail that, uh, you know, if the server fails, could be a security issue on availability. Um, so all of those are parts of uh, what we should have uh, policies for. Change management, this is a big one, right? That's where we talk about things like the trouble ticket. Um, you know, and, and when I talk about uh, change management, you know, there are some things that might happen, like a server fails, and we need to fix it right away. But, uh, you know, so we might have a uh, fast track for getting that trouble ticket done. But again, if it's just somebody saying that they want us to update uh, the newest security patch, uh, we want to plan for that, uh, create uh, often what we call a maintenance window or a time where we do those updates so that we are not trying to uh, take production uh, down very quickly. And so uh, those are also things that, that we should look for. And by the way, we, we want to have this change management policy because one of the other big parts of that is an approval process where, you know, we just 
can't have anybody decide, oh, I'm going to make an update. I'm just going to uh, patch this thing at uh, noon on Friday, uh, and whether you know people want me to or not. I, I mean, we have to go through a process where we can evaluate it, maybe test it, make sure that it's not going to cause conflicts with other applications. Uh, because again, security is availability, and if you uh, do some of these things and take a server down, uh, then you know you've cost uh, production, and uh, often get what we call name recognition because everybody's going to remember who it was that took the servers down.